Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name's Dave Marshall and as you expect, Tom Fletcher is joining me and we are here to talk about episode 6 of Life on Our Planet. Hello Tom. Hello, how are you? I am well prepared with my timer for your 10 sec- no, 14 seconds. We're evolving. We're changing the format. We're moving through the times. Is and- that cheating? I feel like it's cheating. I'm going to aim for 10. It's evolution, Tom. This is what the show is about. We're getting better. The format is evolving. It's going to be better suited to the environment. Okay, okay. This is progress. I'm on board. I'm I'm with you. Go. Progress. So in 14 (laughs) seconds, can you summarize episode six? Go. Episode six starts with possibly the most famous extinction of all, the KPG, where all the dinosaurs, big dinosaurs are wiped out. And the whole episode is about birds, bird evolution. We go back and forth through their evolutionary history and find out all about our feathered friends. It's 14 seconds, everyone. Was it really? Yes. My lord. Okay, good, good. We're on it. Right, we're well, we've, now, we've we? reached perfection. Should we, <laughs> should we stop? I think we, I think we quit while we're ahead. <laughs> We can we can pinpoint the moment where it all goes downhill. Where we peaked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've we've like in in a parallel to dinosaurs, we've yeah. reached the zenith. Zenith the right <laughs> word? I'll go along with that, yeah. <laughs> it might be the wrong word. We might already be seeing the decline, but uh it's all gonna go downhill from here. Something catastrophic is going to happen. Like yeah. a giant bolide meteorite ast- Meteorite or asteroid? Uh, asteroid. I, th- I mean, um, yeah. I mean, bol- bol- boloid or bolide. I think is the correct nomenclature. But uh, I'm willing to go with either meteorite or asteroid interchangeably, um, just as long as you don't interrupt me to correct me. I, I didn't. I didn't correct how you I... pronounce bolide. <laughs> at all I, I'm just you know I'm looking into the future where you go oh I liked your answer there Tom but you mispronounced this and then I get a little bit annoyed <laughs> as I said perfect format perfect <laughs> perfect so um, yeah we're, we're going to be talking to Ed the researcher about the difficulties in you know like looking at something that involves planetary physics impact physics that is so outside of i guess so many of our experiences you don't have a planetary physicist working on your team do you we do yeah i mean we had a few actually that helped um tell us exactly what this thing should look like i mean it, it is unimaginably huge the amount of energy that that you know slammed into earth i mean there are some uh, researchers who have suggested that the initial few seconds of the impact was so uh, powerful that not even light could escape it. And you know, the, the the fallout from that is is enormous. It's obviously hitting the Yucatan Peninsula, and uh, you know, the, all of the sulfurous rocks are being vaporized and slammed up into the air. And uh, yeah, we needed to know in, in quite a lot of detail about what the plume would look like, how fast it would move. Um, and also the, just the the, um, the order of events, you know, the, this this infrared radiation blast, which is is the first thing to happen, traveling at the speed of light and vaporizing everything within a thousand kilometer radius. Uh, yeah, we did. We had a lot of help actually. So uh, Sean Gulick and uh, uh, John and Morgan, um, yeah, Gareth, Carl, uh, lots of people. Yeah. And whilst we have this giant, almost world-ending event, what would have felt like an acute apocalypse, life makes it through. Some life made it through and became an awful lot more successful. Yeah, I, I, that's unbelievable as well. I mean, just just the fact that a meteorite hit Earth, asteroid hit Earth, and caused this this chain of of horror, of chaos, of of hell on Earth, and the recovery of that was was it took a long time, even for the daylight to come back. You know, it might have taken six months to a year. Um, so, but yeah, this is the success story. This is the the one line of dinosaurs that did make it through the birds, and uh, this episode really showcases the diversity of birds and um, yeah, everything from hummingbirds to owls to flamingos, penguins, all sorts of stuff. It's uh, yeah, it's a real mixed bag of uh, of every every favorite bird you can think of. All right, you have to get off the fence and tell me where do you 
draw the line between dinosaur and bird? Um, I, I'm not sure. I think um, well, we 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 show Ankyornis in the series because it's one of the first ones that's starting to uh, glide. Um, this isn't powered flight yet; it's gliding. Um, but yeah, it's it's very bird like at that point because we've got the feathers. It's small, um, but I'm, I don't know. I'm not entirely sure where the cutoff is. <laughs> I don't know either. We should ask somebody who knows, maybe. Quite. Well, <laughs> Anjan was uh, pretty good at laying it all out. Um, it He went into an incredible amount of depth, and he blew my mind in many ways, in many times, with all of the stuff he had to say about dinosaurs and birds and what they were like, and what they weren't like, and how we know what they were like, and what some of the problems with some interpretations were. There is an awful lot. He does not sit on the fence. Okay, he what was his answer? to get off of that fence. Okay, okay. I, Anjan is, is uh, spectacular. He was so helpful on this series from the development stages onwards. Uh, he was always happy to feedback on the, the models and the behavior and the stories. Um, yeah, we, I don't know if we could have done this to the same degree of accuracy without him. Absolutely. So what's your favorite bit of this episode? I think, I think it's probably the hummingbird sequence. Um, mm. the, the photography in that is, is wonderful. Really, really nice. We get such a lot of detail, um, of, of those. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're, they're such charming little birds. Um, but the reveal of that huge, great, big sword, like beak, um, it really speaks to to how uh, how far some of these adaptations can go, you know. To, to in this case, to feed on nectar, and there's some really nice images there of of uh, insects flying and the hummingbirds flying next to them, and they've got lots of shots of insects right next to the, the birds, even even trying to feed on the same flowers, which is uh, yeah a great way to tell the story of hummingbirds are becoming important pollinators. You know, they're taking they're taking that from the insects in that case. So yeah, really nice little sequence that one. Yeah, I really found it amazing just how old owls and hummingbirds are. They had such early radi diversifications, radiations, and I was just like, wow, I can't believe they really are that old and that they've been around for so long. But yeah, absolutely agree. Hummingbirds as well. And again, it, it shows like a lot of my favorite scenes you'd think were a lot of the paleo ones. A lot of the extinct and recreated animals, but then you know it's it's actually a lot of the natural history scenes that provide the context for the paleontology one, uh, paleontological ones. And I just I just love the fact that they are in this series. Yeah, it, and uh, I think it's a really nice excuse to show off some of those lesser shown stories of natural history because you're you're telling the story of the evolution of life. We get. To talk about the more significant steps, you know, the the more significant species uh, along that progressive line. Um, yeah, it's it's a wonderful marriage of the two. So I hope this episode leaves an impact upon you. And Tom, uh, I hope you'll be back for episode seven. I can't get used to your puns, Dave. This is no, not acceptable. I'm not letting that lie. <laughs> an impact. <laughs> That's a good place to end.